The square numbers are so called because they are the number of dots in a square. If we take squares of side lengths 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on, we get the familiar sequence starting 1, 4, 9, 16. Likewise, we can form the triangular numbers, the number of dots in an equilateral triangle. This will give us the sequence 1, 3, 6, 10 and so on. There's a formula for these numbers. The x triangular number is the number of dots in a triangle of side length x. So take one of those triangles and put an identical copy upside down next to it. You get an x by an x plus 1 grid of dots, albeit slightly lopsided. So this has x times x plus 1 dots in it, meaning that one of the two triangles, making up just half the grid, has x times x plus 1 over 2 dots in it. And of course the y square number, the number of dots in a square of side length y, is just y squared. Let's ask the question, what are the square triangular numbers? In other words, the positive integers n, such that n can be written as both the y -th square number and the x -th triangular number for some positive integers x and y. Well, here's a table of the squares and the triangular numbers. Notice that the first triangular number and the first square number are equal. That is, we get a solution to the equation y squared equals x times x plus 1 over 2, just that number we called n above, by taking x equals 1 and y equals 1, which gives n equals 1. But notice also that the 8th triangular number and the 6th square number are equal. They're both 36. So x equals 8 and y equals 6 gives n equals 36. Are there more solutions to this equation? Well, to solve this, we're going to need to remember what I called the fundamental lemma in video 1. We'll use it in the following form. If a, b, and y are positive integers, the greatest common divisor of a and b is 1, and y squared equals a, b, then a is alpha squared and b is beta squared for some positive integers alpha and beta. But that's not quite what we have here. We have y squared equals x times x plus 1 over 2. Now, both sides are still integers, but this division by 2 runs the risk of taking us outside of z somewhere in the middle of the calculation. So let's slightly upgrade our fundamental lemma. If y squared equals a times b over 2, with a and b having greatest common divisor equal to 1, then since both sides are integers, that factor of the 2 in the denominator must be cancelled out somewhere in the numerator. So either a over 2 is an integer, in which case we can just apply the fundamental lemma to a over 2 and b, or b over 2 is an integer, in which case we can apply the fundamental lemma to a and b over 2. Putting this another way, if 2y squared equals ab, then either a equals 2 alpha squared and b equals beta squared, or a equals alpha squared and b equals 2 beta squared. That factor of 2 on the left has to be given to either a or b. Now the same thing happens if there are more factors, by the way. For example, suppose 6y squared equals a times b, with greatest common divisor of a and b still equal to 1. Then we have an extra factor of 2 and an extra factor of 3 on the left. So we have to make sure that they're both accounted for on the right. There are four possibilities here. Either a takes them both, or a takes the 2 and b takes the 3, or a takes the 3 and b takes the 2, or b takes them both. In each case, we have a 2 and a 3. This upgraded fundamental lemma will be important in future videos as well. So, our equation is y squared equals x times x plus 1 over 2. Let's immediately multiply that through by 2. The first thing I want to notice is that the greatest common divisor of x and x plus 1 is automatically equal to 1. After all, suppose we have some non-trivial factor p that divides both x and x plus 1, then it must divide their difference, which is equal to 1. But the only positive integer that divides 1 is 1, so this is a contradiction. Non-trivial factors can't exist here. Okay, applying the fundamental lemma tells us that either x is 2 alpha squared and x plus 1 is beta squared, or x is alpha squared and x plus 1 is 2 beta squared. We have two possible cases. 
Let's call them case1 and case2. Now what do we do? Well, in both cases, these are just simultaneous equations. As with everything here, our alpha and beta are only allowed to be integers, so the rules of the game are a little different from what you might be used to, but still, just as we usually do with simultaneous equations, let's first eliminate x. So, subtracting one equation from the other, in case 1 we get the equation beta squared minus 2 alpha squared equals 1. And in case 2, we get the equation alpha squared minus 2 beta squared equals minus 1. But these are both forms of Pell's equation, which we've already learnt how to solve. And if we find any solution to Pell's equation and substitute it back in, it'll give us values for x and y. So, we've reduced this problem to solving Pell's equation. Let me make a bit of room. Here's all the information we need in both cases. The equation we want to solve is y squared equals x times x plus 1 over 2. This is the number we called n earlier. And we know that all we have to do now is find convergence to root 2. If we call them pn over qn, then in each of these equations the first variable will be pn and the second variable will be qn. I'll just delete that n in the upper right corner because they're not the same n. Now our two cases, case 1 and case 2, come down to whether the right-hand side of Pell's equation is a plus 1 or a minus 1. So, here's a table of natural numbers n, partial denominators an, convergence pn over qn, the number pn squared minus 2qn squared, so that we can check which are solutions to Pell's equation, and given a solution to Pell's equation whether it's a plus 1 or a minus 1, and finally, when we found our solutions, we'll substitute them back into the equations at the top to find x and y. So here are our partial denominators. We worked this out using the continued fraction for root 2 last time. Here are the convergence. We can work these out using the recurrence relations. We evaluate pn squared minus 2qn squared in each case. Now, the n equals 0 column has a minus 1. This is case 2. In other words, it's going to give a solution to the set of equations on the right. I'll just highlight all the case 2 solutions in yellow. For these, the value of x is alpha squared, that is pn squared. So in the n equals 0 column, x equals 1 squared. In the n equals 2 column, x equals 7 squared. In the n equals 4 column, x equals 41 squared, and so on. And all the remaining columns have a plus 1, which makes them case 1. They'll give solutions to the set of equations on the left. Highlighting them in blue, for these, x plus 1 equals beta squared, that is pn squared. And so x equals pn squared minus 1. So in the n equals 1 column, x equals 3 squared minus 1. In the n equals 3 column, x equals 17 squared minus 1 and so on. Now, substituting all of these into our original equation at the very top right of the screen, we can find the values for y. I didn't have space for a final row in this table, but the number of dots in each case is just y squared, or x times x plus 1 over 2. In the next video, we're going to ask the similar question, when our tetrahedral numbers that is, numbers of dots arranged in a triangle-based pyramid, hopefully my diagram makes sense, also square numbers.